Good morning. Welcome to the United Methodist Church at the Dunes. Welcome to church. It's so good to see you. Good morning and welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to church. Good morning. Welcome to church. We're glad you're here. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here this morning. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Church of the Dunes. Welcome to United Methodist Church of the Dunes online worship service for Sunday, October 25th. Usually Pastor Lou is here to welcome you for worship services. He's away today and will be back next Sunday. We have a special guest preacher with us and look forward to the message he has to share during the sermon. We're so glad you've joined us today. Thank you for being here. There are quite a few announcements today, and you can find the details in the bulletin, which is available on the church's website, and in the weekly announcement email that was sent out on Thursday. To highlight just a few things, today we will have a mission moment for Family Promise of the Lakeshore and a hunger offering for Love in Action. Next Sunday is November 1st, All Saints Sunday and Communion Sunday. We'll have special remembrances during both the online and in-person worship services, and there are three options to choose from for receiving communion. Thank you again for being here today. Let's worship God together. Good morning. Please join me in the invitation to worship. We come in reverent awe before the Lord our God, for great is the Lord. We come to join with all creation in singing new songs to the Lord our God. We come in worship and praise for the Lord God is worthy of our praise. We come to share together the news of our glorious Lord's saving deeds. We come with songs and prayers to give well-deserved glory to the Lord. We come to bring our offerings of worship and praise to the Lord our God, whose holy splendor, honor, and majesty shines forth from God's presence. Now would you join me in singing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
so I'm climbing up Five Mile Hill. It's one of my favorite places in Grand Haven. I don't know if you kids know this, but it's called Five Mile Hill, not because it's five miles long or high, but because when you get to the top, you can see for five miles. On a good day, you can even see fruit forest. Wow. Um, so it, can, it is sometimes a climb and makes my legs a little bit sore, especially when I'm running it. I'm trying to race up it sometimes too. But that's the thing about climbing mountains or hills is that the more you climb and the higher you climb, the more you can see. And it's really great. You've got a great view here. Let me see if I can see this behind me. Look at that. The higher you climb, the, the more you can see. But what's really great is once you've accomplished it, once you've worked hard at something, you find this even more rewarding. So next time you have something really hard to do, whether it's a hard math problem, whether it's something at school or church, whether it's something that's really, really difficult, just know that the higher you climb and the harder you work, the more God can bring great things to happen. Like this. Let us join in prayer as we confess our sins together. Merciful and gracious God, we gather here this day, coming together, seeking your healing wisdom. Our lives are filled with anxiety and fear. We turn our backs on people in need and close ourselves away from opportunities to serve. Confusion and anger abound in our nation and in our hearts. Forgive us when we have chosen the pathways of greed and fear instead of the highway of peace and hope. Bind up our sounds and calm our spirits. Teach us again to turn to you in love. Write the commandment to love our neighbor as we ourselves would want to be loved, as you have loved us. It is in Jesus' name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God's love has been poured over us to heal and nourish our thirsting spirits. We have been forgiven. Now we are challenged to go forth in peace and hope to a hurting world. Thanks be to God for all God's mercies shown continually to each one of us. Amen. From the abundant ways in which God has blessed our lives, let us share our offerings in joy and gratitude. We thank each and every one of you who has continued to give to this ministry and through this ministry. If you would like to give, you can send your offering to 717 Sheldon Road, Grand Haven, Michigan, or go to our website and click on the Give tab to access our online giving. At this time, we are going to hear from one of the many missions the Church of the Dunes supports through these offerings. Seeing a family crisis like an eviction is stressful enough when you pass by. The unimaginable sorrow of seeing someone's life and everything they were working to build cast aside like trash is a harsh reminder of how hard life can be. Now, imagine the stress caused to the family that was evicted. Everything they own out on the street and there's nowhere left to turn and no one left to ask for help. Parents and children are often separated, men going to one shelter and women and kids to another. Separation leads to more stress and quite often dooms a family that never had the tools to become successful in the first place. At Family Promise of the Lakeshore, things were a little different. We keep families together. That is one of the most important 
points I can try and get across to the community. Um, moms and dads are not separated. We work with them together. We keep them together. Family Promise is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. We are so proud of what we've accomplished. We have served 230 families, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you stop and think, it's 12 city blocks of houses on both sides. That's how many families we've served. While families are in the program, not only are they taught the essential life skills they need to improve their chance for success, they're treated with dignity and respect, which they might not find anywhere else. Family Promise offers classes in tenancy, budgeting, nutrition, and parenting, and program members are actively seeking housing and employment. Kids attend school as normal, and Family Promise offers tutors for an hour every day to help keep children up with their schoolwork. Did you know a child loses three months education every time they move? Displacement takes a huge toll on the entire family. At night, our area churches open their doors to give our families safe haven, and most of all, togetherness. Our area church's generosity offers stability, sanctuary, and also lets the churches put their mission goals into action locally, helping people directly in the communities in which they live. While Family Promise is not necessarily a faith-based organization, we know that the spirit which our program recipients find shelter show them that they're from a community who cares, and that while they're getting back up on their feet, they're free from judgment, and will have the needed room to breathe while they work to improve their lives. Families have to go through a lot. They, they look for jobs first, and then housing, and we have life skill classes, uh, parenting classes, budgeting classes, and for the first time last night, we had a realtor come in and speak to them about renting and the possibility of even buying low-income homes. So uh, it's, it, it's a good experience for families and it gives them, gives them a whole range of opportunities that they wouldn't ordinarily have. And our families too, while they're here, save 80% of their income towards the day that they leave. Many of our families can leave with $1,500, $2,000, which is more money than they've usually had their whole lives. As stability is found, Family Promise of the Lakeshore helps families transition back into their own home. Family Promise offers a very unique home goods and linens pantry where essentials like towels, sheets, dinnerware, silverware, and small appliances can be taken to the family's new home. It's a new start with some new knowledge and a new outlook on what it takes to succeed as a family that was able to stay together through the most stressful time they might ever see. We have a an average 90% success rate, which means 90% of the families that come in leave, leave Family Promise housed. Long term, I would bet 70% of them remain housed. In the end, stronger families that stay together build stronger relationships and stronger communities. A new outlook is there because Family Promise of the Lakeshore offered the essentials to those who had never been able to find them anywhere else. Your donations are appreciated, your questions are welcomed, and your belief in our mission is paramount. We are Family Promise of the Lakeshore, and we're keeping families and Muskegon together. Hi, this is Marian from Family Promise. Let me say up front, we really miss you. This has been a year of changes. Everything is different now. We appreciate your flexibility and your commitment. As Church of the Dune volunteers, your health and safety remain very important to us. Because of that, we don't anticipate any operational changes until there is a vaccine. Hang in there with us. The families still need you, and so do we. Thank you. Please join me in the dedication of our offerings. Lord of all we see and all that we cannot see, Give us this day a glimpse of the complexities of the world and the simplicity of living our lives centered in you, loving you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbors well. Bless the gifts we offer you, but in our giving, help us focus on these other more basic gifts. May the love we show you and others be a testimony of whom we follow 
and who is worthy of our devotion. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. A reading from the Gospel, Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, whose commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus called him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, Deuteronomy 34, reading verses 1 through 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, 
which was opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb, and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was one hundred and twenty years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for thirty days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequalled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Thanks be to God. Amen. From the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verses 1 through 3. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. Let us pray. God, open our ears that we may hear, open our eyes that we may see, open our minds and our souls to your word. Amen. So, I was watching Mulan with Lillian, my seven-year-old, and she asked me, Daddy, what's an ancestor? It's saying that these people were Mulan's ancestor. What does that mean? What does the word ancestor mean to you? In explaining it to my ever-curious daughter, I told her that ancestors were Mulan's relatives who had died. Like, Granny's my ancestor? Exactly. As well as my grandmother, even though you never met her. So ancestors can be people we've never met? Most of them are. I took this completely unscientific poll on social media on what people think of when they hear that word ancestor. I get replies like the following. My German heritage, my parents, grandparents, great-grands, etc. Also, aunts, uncles from many previous generations and cousins. All people from the beginning. Some smart Alec even responded with, Mulan. This morning, as we reflect on the death of Moses, as told to us in the book of Deuteronomy, especially in this whirlwind that is 2020, I'd like to invite us to expand our working definition of the word ancestor to include one other person, yourself. Think about it for a minute. You are someone else's ancestor. In some cases, literally. If God is willing, Lillian's children's children will talk about their crazy great-grandfather. You are someone else's ancestor. In some cases, literally. In all cases, spiritually. We are, all of us, 
holding on to the very best of the traditions that we got, where we are, yes, but at the same time, we are the ones who will pass that torch on to generations to come. You are someone else's ancestor, and if you think that's a little mind-bending, hold on. Relationships can be complex because we wear these different hats at the same time. A mother can be a confidant, a son can be a business partner, spouses can be best friends even when they feel like moral enemies sometimes. Our parents or guardians cared for us when we were children. Many of us are now caring for our parents or older relatives as our strength has increased and theirs is diminishing. What if there was one role? One facet of every one of your relationships that took precedence. Okay, okay, so like, I'm a major nerd. I remember when I got my first apartment in Muncie, Indiana. I was so proud. And my mom asked, so how far from campus is your new place? I said, it's 1.3 miles from the center of the college. Really, Jeff? Can't you ever just give an approximation? Okay, Mom, it's approximately 1.3 miles from the center of campus. There are different hats, roles that we play in each relationship, but what if we could just nerd this out? What if we could just use raw number crunching to see if we can prioritize? Of all the roles that we could think of in all of our relationships, in which one do we spend the most time? I'll use Lillian as an example. She is, of course, my daughter. I'm her dad, but I also get to be one of her homeschool teachers, sometimes a coach. When we're talking together about the discoveries of life, she's very much my friend, and I hope that this continues. But how does any of that compare to eternity? The 40 or 50 years I hope to have with the privilege of being her father are but a fleeting moment compared to the eternity I will have walking with her in Christ. Of all the possible ways to think about my daughter, primary and perhaps the most precious is that Lillian is my sister. My sister in Christ. And this is true of everyone. The ancestors that came before us, familial or otherwise, the descendants that will follow us, they are our sisters and our brothers. Ephesians tells us that God is love and he chooses each of us for adoption into the family of Christ. One of my favorite movies is Evan Almighty, where this guy is called by God to build a literal ark in suburban Washington. Most of the film is played out for laughs, but there are a few moments of poignancy throughout. In one scene, a reporter skeptically asks, Evan, the title character, why would you think that God would choose you? And his reply, I believe God chooses everyone. You are someone's ancestor because God has chosen you into God's family. Yes, yes, our ancestors can be and mostly are people we've never met. When we think of Moses and Ruth and David and Mary and Elizabeth and Paul and Peter, they're not just figures from history. They're not only pillars of our faith, they are, but they are so much more than that. They are our sisters and our brothers. When Thomas doubts, it's your brother questioning. When Hannah sings, she's your sister rejoicing. Next time you read your Bible, try it out. See what happens when we read with our spiritual ancestors, and not just about them. When we meet our ancestors and ponder our descendants to come, because we are all in the same family that spans all of time and heaven and earth and connects us. Every past and every future person who lives in the clutches of God's grace through Christ is our sister, is our brother. God has adopted us all. If we truly knew that our spiritual ancestors 
we're brothers and sisters, if we truly believed that future generations are our sisters and brothers, just imagine what would happen when we start seeing each other that way. Right here. Right now. Modern Christians are your brothers and sisters. That means Methodists, and not so Methodists. That means Democrats and Republicans. That means first service people and second service people. That means Christmas and Easter service people. People from all walks of life. And yes, even Packers fans. So Lily and Teresa and I are watching football. It's a great way for Lillian to pick up some new vocabulary. This was a few years back, and Lillian asked, Daddy, what's an opponent? An opponent is someone you respect so much that you want them to play their very best at a sport so you can play against them. Teresa, Mom, adds, and so you can crush them into the ground. Well, that too, but it's part of the game. What if we treated each other more like that? Good old, healthy, give you a nuggy sibling rivalry. But respect and dignity and assuming the best out of people. We see a yard sign for, you know, the other guy, and we wave. Or better, talk to them. Or better, maybe listen. Perhaps learn. Why? Because they're your brother and sister, and the world is watching. Most of us have made up our minds on the election by now. Many of you have already voted. Some have asked me this question, then why do you still talk politics? What's the point? I was consulting my primary news source, which is memes reposted by friends on Facebook. No. But it was. And seriously, sometimes a good meme is like good comedy. It works because there's an element of truth to the humor. And it said this, I am way less concerned with who you vote for than I am with how you treat people who vote differently than you. Maybe we should talk politics and learn to do it civilly because the world is watching. And so are generations to come. How we act here, how we act now, will ripple outward to infinity because we are someone else's ancestor. Our great-grandchildren will not only ask who we voted for, but they will ask how we treated each other while we did it. I remember my first election. It was pretty magical because I got to vote in a presidential election my senior year of high school. So it was a big deal. I was working at Wendy's in Green Haven, and I remember one of my coworkers saying that she still needed to vote, but she wasn't going to be able to because she couldn't make it to the polls before they closed. I said, why don't I cover that part of your shift? And she looked at me baffled. You and I had talked back and forth. You know who I'm going to vote for. I know who you just voted for. Won't my vote cancel yours out? Why would you do this? Because I believe in our democracy more than I believe in my candidate. What if we could find a way to do something like this today? Our sisters and our brothers are watching. Those in our past are demanding it. Those in our future are hoping for it. Those here present are hungry and thirsting for it. I know it's difficult. It may seem downright impossible, but this is our current and our future calling. Acting civilly in the face of violence, pushing for justice without resorting to insult. And it's really, really hard. But here's the good news. You are not alone in this. We look at our scripture this morning, we see Moses climbing a mountain, being shown the promised land, and then told he will never enter it. Remember that whole water from the rock thing? The Israelites were dying of thirst, God provided a rock. All Moses had to do was tap it with that stick of his, and water would flow. 
But Moses took it upon himself to showboat a little bit. That's a whole other sermon. But long story short, Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land. And he doesn't complain. Somehow Moses gets it. Moses, who later in the same chapter we read, quote, did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt. And quote, no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds in the sight of all Israel. And Moses doesn't enter the promised land. Because the promise wasn't to Moses individually. It was to God's people, the people of Israel. As big of a figure as Moses was, God's promise is bigger. God's plan is bigger. Moses' life was a legacy, certainly. But read really closely here. Moses goes up the mountain by himself, he and God, and he dies in God's timing, and he is buried there. By who? Moses is buried by God because God is a principal actor in all of this. Moses wasn't leaving a legacy. God was leaving a legacy through Moses' life, and that is very different. Moses didn't complain because this wasn't fair, that this was just a technicality. There are no technicalities with God. He simply accepted God's direction. He climbed that mountain that was in front of him. He saw what he could see and had faith that that would be enough. I would invite you to read Hebrews 11 in its entirety sometime this week, and you will see the promise of God given to those later called the cloud of witnesses was not fulfilled in their lifetimes. But the promise spanned across generations and centuries. The mountain we are given may be hard. It may not be the mountain we want. But this is the thing about mountains. The higher we climb, the clearer we see. As we know that we are facing is working for God's good. When we know that what we are facing is working for God's good, even if we don't feel it right now, or possibly ever, we can rest assured that the promise always is that God is with us and is working through us in some way. That, that is faith that we cannot see. This is a vision that the ancestors were commended for. This is what we are invited into. Well, what is God's plan for my life? Do you hear this? Do you hear this sometimes? A lot? Do you, do you ever ask this question? What is God's plan for my life? I know I do. Moses didn't. Moses didn't ask, what is God's plan for my life? Rather, he lived his life in a way that asked this powerful question. How does my life fit into God's plan? Not just God's plan now, God's plan forever. How does your life fit into God's plan? What will God's legacy through you as an ancestor be? How will what you do touch your future brothers and sisters in Christ? Deuteronomy 34 shows us two things. Climb the mountain and see. Climb. Climb the mountain that you have been given. It may not be the mountain you want. If your 2020 has been anything like mine, it is probably not the mountain you want. Some of us had to figure out how to work from our homes. Others wish they could stay home but had to work. Parents have become teachers. Teachers have had to fill in the gaps and in many ways act as parents. And then there are those who have fallen ill and those who have fallen. Climb the mountain you have been given. Claw, scrape, push, and keep going. Because in doing so, you are part of God's redeeming and loving plan for the whole world. And love is work. Hard work. 
So, make that call, write the card, bake the casserole, and know that it will be exceedingly difficult. Most of us can rile off the greatest commandment, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, love your neighbor as yourself. How many of us remember that this word from Jesus is in response to in the middle of a really ugly situation? Jesus is taking on factions from both sides of the aisle, Sadducees and Pharisees at the same time. And they're trying to trap him in his words. It's like there's this first century Facebook battle going on, and people are flaming each other back and forth, and at Son of God, hashtag Jesus replies in the comment section, oh, by the way, that thing in Deuteronomy about loving God, yeah, that one over there, that's pretty important. And that thing in Leviticus about loving each other, yeah, they're actually um, related, and oh, yeah, like, really do it, too. It is that simple. And it is that hard. Jesus gives us the greatest commandment, and he reminds us to love one another, which means everybody. In the middle of the storm, he is our presence in turmoil, our wonderful counselor alongside, our kumbaya in the struggle. Climb. Climb the mountain you have been given. God is helping you, pulling you up when needed, pushing you along when necessary, there with you. What happens when you climb the mountain? You begin to plant seeds in whose shade you will never sit. Because you can see so much further. Like butterflies. Those monarch butterflies, you know how they migrate down to Southern California or Mexico, right? thousands of miles. I had to Google this. How does something so small make a journey that's so long? And the answer is they don't. No individual butterfly that leaves Michigan will ever return. They leave so that the colony survives and eventually what we would call their great-grandchildren return. My mom was visiting my church in Pasadena. We were sitting in the pew and the electric guitars were wailing. Yes, we actually had a Grammy winner who ran the soundboard in California. It's crazy. But the electric guitars are going and the drums are going. And my mom says, this is, this is nice, but I just don't get that much out of this kind of praise music. Yeah, yeah, mom. See the older couple over there? And that really older lady sitting there? They don't either. They are here to support the service where younger families are coming, where the future church is and will be. Because they're planting seeds for trees in whose shade they will never sit. Climb that mountain you have been given and you will see things that you otherwise would never see. So here's a quarantine story, you ready? This guy is at like one of the top schools, Oxford, Cambridge, something like that. A virus hits and everyone has to get sent home. He ends up on the family farm, bored out of his mind. So he starts looking at how the moon moves across the sky and looking very carefully at various things dropping from trees at the farm. So it was because of a quarantine that Isaac Newton discovers universal gravitation. Oh, and because he was so bored, he ended up inventing calculus at the same time. I know what you're saying. I'm no Isaac Newton. But it was Newton who quoted the ancients when he said, If I have seen further, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. You can be someone else's shoulder. You are a giant of the faith to help future generations that you cannot even see. 
The writer of Hebrews tells us that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we cannot see. As you climb your mountain, no matter what mountain that might be, have faith that everything you are doing is part of something much greater and that will resonate across time. When people look back at this time in history through the yelling, the noise, the pain, the suffering, they will see quiet acts of kindness, old acts of everyday bravery. That is what will define us. With God as our help, with God by our side, I have faith in that. We can see so much more than those who have come before us. We are called to pass that clarity of vision on to those who would follow God as our sisters, as our brothers in Christ. God's invitation for all of us this morning, climb, climb that mountain you have been given. Look to the horizon across that river and see a glimpse of God's wonder. I remember my grandmother's funeral, sitting in a mostly empty church. Friends, a couple, some close family. My grandmother had been very active in her prime, but had been physically unable to go to church for quite some time. And I'm her sitting there, hearing the choir. I have the red, sir. Friction. I am the life. We had talked to the minister ahead of time. He was walking us through what things would look like. I remember asking him, the, the, the choir, what? The choir is going to come and sing at this old lady's funeral? Not one of them has ever met Nana. They never knew her. And the minister smiles gently and says, well, not yet. She's our sister in Christ. And we so look forward to meeting her someday. Hear the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. God of the mountaintop, in prayer, you walk us to the highest point from which we are offered an opportunity to view the world as you see it and the world as you would wish it to be. There is much to be thankful for. We enjoy opportunities of good health and reasonable living standards, of times of relaxation and times to work, of a roof over our head and opportunities to feed our bellies and our imaginations and our hearts. We praise you for all that is good and pray you will draw our eyes from our own concerns to those of our neighbors, our community, our world. We pray for those in need of love in our community, both here in church and in the larger community of which we are part. Help us not to be afraid of what is different or unknown to us but instead willing to offer friendship and accept the opportunities to grow in knowledge and experience. We pray for those in power and leadership and those who govern to offer leadership in difficult times. May those who seek to serve as politicians and leaders of communities find themselves shaped by the words, hopes, and ideals of those who place their trust in them. Our eyes are drawn to places of hunger and need. Teach us to share the resources we would covet and enable us through the activity of your spirit in prayer and with action to be part of a creation where all are treated fairly and all have enough to eat. Holy God, we pray that our lives be shaped by you to offer others your love shown in our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. benediction. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Go forth into this aching, hurting world with God's love, offering healing, hope, and peace to all. Go in peace, and may God's peace surround you always. Amen.